Victory. Title of my message is Victory of the Devil. Cables, yes, uh, chapter 3, verse 8b. Let's read the cables together. Yes. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. The last lesson, we thought of God's great love that motivated him to send his son into this world to make us his children. And that is what we are. The children of God are destined for the glory of the future, glorious future, that we shall be like him. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself. <clears throat> in short three verses, we pondered on justification, glorification, and sanctification. They are the whole teaching of Christianity. Again, I thank and praise God for his great love that we should be called children of God. What a privilege it is to call God Abba Father. In today's, today's passage, chapter 4, verse 4 through 10, is the continuation of purifying ourselves in his love and the hope of glorification. Purification is certainly related to doing what is right and be righteous. For this, John had to record the purpose of the Son of God coming into this world. That is to destroy, uh, that is to take away our sins and to destroy the devil's work. So that you can truly do what is right and be righteous. Still, let's think about these two great works of Christ. First, to take away our sins. Verse 4 says, Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. In King James Version, Sin is the transgression of the law. It's clearly written that sin is breaking the law. Sinners are lawbreakers or transgressors of the law. And they are under condemnation of the law. And so, under God's wrath. Sin is not taken, taken lightly. Sin is not merely showing one's weakness or just a failure. Sin is a serious problem, breaking God's law. We think about lawlessness. It's a state of living as if there is no law. They seem to be free, but in fact, the evil one is working rampantly without restraint. To destroy them, ruin them with this since pollution and power. The children of God are to have right understanding, correct understanding of sin. Sin is dreadful. And once understanding of or attitude toward the sin, largely relies on the degree of knowing the grace of Jesus Christ. So, John writes, but we know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. This can be one of the most significant verses one of the most important messages in the whole Bible. Let's think about it. Can you imagine a person in whom is no sin, 
seamless one with a complete purity. Bible says, there is no one righteous, even one. There is no one who does good, even one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But here is one, in whom is no sin. Is Jesus Christ. According to Hebrews chapter 7, he is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners. The best kind of man, the best kind of man, David confessed, surely I am sinful at birth, and sinful from the time my mother conceived me. But Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born sinless. Moreover, he was tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. He lived by the law and kept all the laws, fulfilling all the demands of the law. So he's the end of the law. In describing Christ's suffering, Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 2, He committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. Even extreme suffering, he committed no sin. He lived a sinless, perfect life. He is the Son, God's chosen one, whom God loved and delighted in. He appeared so he might take away our sins. He thought of the serious of sin. We can think more. Sin started by one man's disobeying God's command. This seems to be an insignificant thing. However, sin spread and covered the whole world. God had to judge the world with a flood. The flood judgment wiped out all mankind, probably billions of people, except Noah's eight families. That's the dreadful effect of sin. Yet, even through the flow of judgment, sin was not taken away. Sin was still in man, and sinful human beings again challenged God. So, it was unthinkable to take away sin. It seems to be impossible to take away sin. But here is written, he appeared so that he might take away our sins. This is, I believe, the key message of the Bible. He appeared to take away our sin. And to the point, it is that he became the atoning sacrifice for our sins. John wrote it two times. Atoning sacrifice for our sins and for the sins of the world. The qualification of the sacrifice for the atonement was that the offering of the sacrifice is to be a man and without sin. Jesus was the only one, Jesus is the only one who met such a qualification. And Jesus was willing to be such an offering.
In Hebrews 9.27 says, He has appeared once for all at the end of the age, at the culmination of the age, to do away with the sin by the sacrifice of himself. John wrote in John's Gospel, the words of John the Baptist concerning Jesus. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Yes, Jesus is the Lamb of God who is to be sacrificed as the reality of the shadow of numerous animals being slaughtered, killed in the Old Testament. It was the sin of all mankind. Yes, Jesus is the Lamb who was slain by the crucifixion. However, we cannot overlook another point. When John used the words, take away our sins, take away the sin of the world, we cannot overlook the other point here. In Leviticus chapter 16, on the day of judgment, or on the day of atonement, this annual event, on the day of atonement, two goats were taken and presented before the Lord. One was chosen by lot. One was chosen for the sacrifice. Another was chosen to be presented alive before the Lord and was sent, sent in the desert as a scapegoat. How it became scapegoat? Written further. Aaron the high priest is to put his both hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it, all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, put them on the head of the goat, and he shall send the goat into the desert in the care of a man appointed for their task. The goat carries on itself all their sins. To a solitary place, and the man will release it in the desert. Go home. And the man who releases it must wash his clothes and bathe himself. Scapegoat written four times. Where? In the desert, the solitary place. What a picture of the scapegoat. The scapegoat, its reality is found in Jesus Christ. Innocent Son of God took, took upon himself all our sins, was sent into the desert to a solitary place, a land of abandonment when he died on the cross, abandoned by God. In this way, he took away all our sins. All our sins were imputed on him. He separated sin from sinners. He detached our sins from us. Both of Hebrews wrote, he suffered outside the city gate. He was ignored by the world, but he did the most significant work before God in entire human history. The prophet Isaiah, old prophet, had prophesied 
choose purest vow transgressions, as cursed vow iniquities, to the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. You all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us, each one of us turned to his own way. And the Lord laid upon him all the iniquities of all. He laid upon him all our iniquities. He was cut off from the land of the living. In this way, Christ Jesus solved the man's sin problem, taking away our sins once for all. Isn't it amazing? Marvelous work of God took away our sins once for all. How precious this Jesus is. We believe this. All our sins, sin of pride, lust, jealousy, self-love, rather, in God love, self-love, love of the world, fear of people, unbelief and all worries, all our sins are imputed on him. He carried them upon himself to be killed outside the city gate in the solitary place. When I made it on preparing this message, I found that my sense of living, my sense of humanist way of thinking and living were wicked before God. Because of lack of fear of God, I could not help those who whom God put under my care, clearly leading them to God. At its crucial time, I couldn't. Humanist way of thinking and living what we wicked before God. And Isaiah chapter 66 verse 2 says, this is the one I esteem. He who is uh, humble and contrite, he who trembles at my word. I found myself that I did not tremble at God's word. So I could not obey God's word absolutely. As a result, I could not help God's word of shape rightly to obey the word of God. With my sins, God had mercy on me to come to this Jesus, my Lord, with a repentant heart. I have mercy on me to look up at this Jesus again on you. I took away all my sins and sent into the desert to the place. And have it renewed in this ways. Truly, I found on you that my salvation is only due to him. Here is a assurance of salvation because he took away all my sins. In this grace, I pray, Lord, help me to be the one really tremble at his word. Such word, he appeared to take away our sins. He'll appear again. We think about this Jesus who became scapegoat of our sins, no human situation can be a problem. The more, the worse the situation, the better to understand this Jesus, to know this Jesus, and go deeper into his grace. Is it true? The worse the situation, the better to know him. Go deeper into his grace. Yes, Christ suffered outside the city gate. Then what we must do? The author of Hebrews says, let's go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. May we not lose sight of this Jesus. May we not ignore this Jesus, O oh Lord.
Praise Jesus. I praise Jesus, my Savior. Again, we may not the sight of this Jesus. Again, scapegoat our sins in such a way, going to a certain place. All our sins. That's including the son of Daniela and Eunice. Uh, can look at this Jesus. And here, when you think about the words, he appeared to take away our sins. You can think of the deeper meaning of this purpose. And Hebrews says continually, yes, he suffered outside the city gate. Why? To make his people holy through, the, through his own blood. That's a clear purpose. To make his people holy through his own blood. And Paul said in Titus chapter 2, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It is us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, self upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, to redeem us from all the weakness, to purify for himself a people to that very his own, eager to do what is good. What a purpose it is when Jesus appeared to take away our sins. His purpose is to prepare a people. When he took away our sins and redeemed us, his purpose is to prepare a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. To redeem them, purified people can do truly good in his sight. So the people of God are so precious. Christ's purpose is that the proud becoming the humble, the self-centered, selfish becoming God-centered and selfish. The, God, God, the people fearing become God fearing. And many women of calculation and unbelief becoming many women of faith. The simple, the wise. This purpose, out of ugly, the ugly, the beautiful come out, out of the worthless, truly valuable come out. And it's sinners becoming saints, the sinners. What a purpose he had. People, people was eager to do. And Paul described it this way. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to the good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Amen. How precious this words are. Let's read this verse together. Verse 5, please. But we know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Eunice, can you read this verse? No sin. Amen. Mm. And now, it says further, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues sin has either seen him or known him. This is obvious. We think about Jesus who appeared to take away our sins. He says, dear friends, do not let anyone lead you astray. Then he has written, chapter 2, I'm writing these things to you concerning those who are trying to lead you astray. Yes, there are those and things that try to lead you astray. But it's our responsibility to keep ourselves from all these things. And he continues, he who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. In the grace of Jesus taking away our sins, we are to do what is right and be righteous. 
this is in accordance with uh, what Peter said in First Peter chapter two. People our sins in his body on the tree, so that we might die to sins before righteousness. Being what is right is personally, practically obeying God's word, obeying God's word personally. And I could do this piece of word in Revelation study. So Jesus Christ spoke to the church in Smyrna. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I'll give you a crown of life. I pray that I may be really faithful to the point of death, serve the ministry of God's word, so I am totally unworthy to serve in a servant of God's word. Personal obedience. Second, to destroy the devil's work. Now, verse 8 says, He who does what is simple is of the devil. Because the devil is sinning from the beginning. So he who does continue to sin, doing what is simple is of the devil. Jesus said to the unbelieving Jews who claim that they are Abraham's descendants and God is their father, Still, no ears to hear Jesus' word. He said, you, are, you belong to your father, the devil. Jesus wanted them to really accept his word, which will belong to the father. And here, devil is sinning from the beginning. Yes, devil sinned, rebelled against God, and fell from heaven. Also in Genesis, you see how he sinned. He tempted Adam and Eve to disobey God's word and rebel against God. He deceived a woman by distorting the word of God and then planting his word that is a lie. If you eat of it, you'll be like God. Yes, one person in Genesis, he deceived the woman. In Revelation, he deceived the whole world. The whole world goes astray. But the important thing is that as God is real, devil is real. As God exists, God, devil exists. Jesus recognized him and exposed him in John's Gospel three times as the prince of the world. Jesus recognized him, exposed it. And Apostle Paul said in Corinthians, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel. And in Ephesians, in which, in your transgression sins, you used to live when you follow the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. So devil is the God of this age and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. And John used the word the evil one regarding the devil or Satan. He said in chapter 2, I'm writing to you, young man, because you have overcome the evil one. Again, the evil one. In chapter 3, do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one. In chapter 5, the one who was born of God keeps him safe. The evil one cannot harm him. And again, chapter 5, the whole world is under the, under the control of the evil one. Evil one five times. Here's chapter 3, in three verses, the devil four times. Again, devil is real, as God is real. Devil exists. But there are many, there seems many Christians who does not recognize the existence of the devil? Then, what the devil will do? Can you imagine? Your enemy is not recognized. Devil, even can work rampantly in the person's life and in this world. And here, yes, she appeared, son of God appeared to destroy the devil's work. You must understand the devil's work. You know that behind the tragic event and destructive work, like a unspeakable killing of a people, homicide, genocide, is the devil. But the devil works in a very subtle way. He appears to a simple nature with a sweet lie, satisfying, trying to satisfy our itching ears. He appears to the lust of the 
the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and pride of life. That's how the devil also tempted the woman. Think about this more in chapter 3. The woman, after hearing the devil's sweet lie, the woman's view of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was changed. Before, when she saw the tree, the symbol of God's presence, they produced holy fear in her. But after hearing the words of the devil, now the tree looked different. She saw that the tree of the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and desire for gain wisdom. When her view was changed, this matter of time, she took it and ate it, and he gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate it. In the same way the devil works. Appealing to the lust of the lust of the flesh. Also, same way he tempts people to love the world. From which comes the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. In the same way. And the devil is the whole world astray. He uses, he uses kings and presidents and powerful people of the world for his own agenda and purpose. Use them. That is to establish his kingdom in this world, eliminating God. And put all people under his control. We saw this in the study of Revelation. Two beasts working together. One is political leader and religious leader work together for their own agenda of the devil. Put all people under his control for his kingdom. In his story, no one dared to destroy the devil's work, but Jesus came to destroy the work of the devil. He came. What is what he had to do? He himself has to fight the devil. He had to defeat the devil personally. On the battle. They will tempt Jesus in the same way, appealing to their flesh, eye, and pride of life. What's the devil's temptation? The devil said, You are hungry after fasting prayer. So make this stone bread. And then he said, Come down from the high place, and God will lift you up through the angel. What a sensation. People will see, Wow, with eyes they see. And you'll have shortcut for success. And then, worship me. I'll give all this world to you, other glory. Glory of the world and power will be yours. A plenty of pride of life. But Jesus defeats the devil with words of God, saying, It's written, man does not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Do not put the Lord your God to test. And worship God only. He defeated the And then he could begin his public ministry. And one time he taught in the synagogue, and a man cried out. An evil spirit in his heart cried out. Jesus of Nazareth, have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. Holy one of God. The devil, evil one, evil spirit knew. Just cast him out. And evil spirits were scared before Jesus. They fell down before him, saying, crying, you are the son of God. And Jesus proclaimed, throughout his messianic ministry, proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God. He taught diligently the truth of God's word, even during the Passion Week. And one time, on one occasion, he drove out a mutant demon spirit, a mutant deaf spirit. And people criticized him, saying, by the help of Beelzebub, he's driving out demons. Just responded, Satan or devil is not that stupid. He does not divide his house. Is power of God and said, If I drive out demons by the finger of God, the kingdom of God has come to you. Here we see the purpose of destroying devil's work is to destroy devil's kingdom and bring God's kingdom in the hearts of people. And ultimately, God's kingdom will be accomplished. Kingdom of Christ is second coming. 
And after saying this, if I drive out demons by the finger of God, the kingdom of God has come to you, Jesus said. When a strong man, fully armed, has his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone else stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor, the armor in which the man trusted, divides up the spoils. Here, strong man is the devil, Satan. Stronger one is Jesus. The final temptation came when Jesus was hanging on the cross. All sorts of people, passers by, religious leaders, soldiers who crucified him, even the criminal who was dying on the cross. All sorts of people heard insults at him and come down from the cross. Save yourself. But yes, Jesus had power to come down and save himself and his followers. But he stayed on the cross to the end in obedience to God's will to save his people in God's way and thus defeat the devil's temptation. There is death on the cross and resurrection. He completely defeated the devil and manifested the devil's destiny is determined to eternal punishment, eternal destruction with his kingdom crumbling. Yeah, what is important is that, that Jesus redeems his people in the grace of forgiveness of sins, rescues them from Satan's rule to God's rule, from Satan's kingdom, kingdom of Satan, to the kingdom of his son, from the dominion of darkness to the of light. Rescued people. Apostle Paul, when he stood before King Auripa and before other powerful people, he testified to Jesus' words to him. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. And Paul said in Colossians, for he has rescued us from the domain of darkness, brought us into the kingdom of Satan he loves, a kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That's important point. He redeems his people, brings people from the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of the Son he loves. But personally, we have to know that devil works diligently to mislead believers, seeking every opportunity. So Apostle Paul Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 5, your enemy the devil prowls around looking for someone to devour. Here. Yes. We should know that uh, then okay, it's okay, yeah. Looking for no, so Peter said in first Peter, as I said, okay, your enemy the devil. Crawls around looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand one in faith. Because your brothers throughout the world are going on the same suffering. So battle with the devil is common to all true believers. And James says, Submit then to God. Submit yourself to God. Resist him and he'll fully away. Come near to God and he'll come near to you. So time of suffering, temptation, testing is the time to come near to God. And our faith can be refined. More precious than refined gold. And yes, Jesus came to destroy the devil's work. But he did not let the devil, he still let the devil exist. Why? It's so that we may also overcome the devil, become overcomers of the devil. In Jesus, we have assured victory. When he took away our sins, he took away our sins. The devil has no ground to accuse us. And Jesus himself showed 
his example, how to fight the devil, defeat with the written words of God, by relying on the words of God, absolutely. That's why John wrote in chapter 2, I write to you, young man, because you have overcome the evil one. Again, I write to you, young man, because you are strong, and the love of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. In Jesus, we have a short victory of the devil. That's why John wrote. We have overcome the evil one. We have overcome the evil one. And then, the revelation we see. They, saints, overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. And here, as we know that, the devil's work will be intense when the end time is coming close. Last April, on the Passion Week, Calvary police arrested a pastor, Arthur Polosky, because of his COVID non-compliance. Arresting was understandable, arresting him, but how he was arrested? The police made him kneel down, dragged him on his knees on the street. This kind of sin can be seen in a communist country like China. But this event is displayed in a country like Canada, which was, uh, has been a Christian country, missionary and nation. Here, once in 1930, many missionaries came to Korea. We are so thankful. They keep their lives more than 200 missionaries. But now we see that the spirit of Antichrist is rapidly increasing in this country. And we still watch out what is happening in our country and in the whole world. Jesus said when he talked about the signs of the end of the age, yes, Jesus said, then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. You will be hated by all nations because of me. At the time, many will turn away from the faith, will betray and hate each other. Many false crosses will appear and deceive many people. But you stand firm to the end, you will be saved. Yes, you can stand firm with faith in Jesus. And he says, the one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. God's seed remains in him. That's the new life of Christ. Seed will grow. And Jesus said, word of God, seed of the kingdom of God, it will grow. And then he says, this is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of God of the devil are. There are only two kinds of people, children of God and children of the devil. No middle ground. There are only two kinds of living, to live as children of God or to live as children of the devil. And anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God. No one is anyone who does not love his brother. His brother can be those whom God put around me for the living. We thank and praise God for Jesus who appeared to, to take away our sins and destroy the devil's work. He's the most precious one with the victory over sin and death. In this grace, in his grace of taking away our sins, may we stand firm in faith in him. In the victory of the devil to live by faith in this generation. Amen. The Father, thank you very much for us to think about the great works of Christ. Father, who made it on Jesus, who became scapegoat taking upon himself all our sins, being sent into the desert, solitary place, 
They should be killed outside the city gate. Father, by the amazing work of God, Lord, this happened once for all. And we believe this. In this ways, we can come to Him with our sins. Be renewed in this ways. Father, surely no human situation can be a problem. We may not even notice Jesus. Please help us to treasure him and look up at him. Also, firmly believe that he came to destroy the devil's work. The devil's work is rampant. And personally, in this world, uh, we can stand firm in faith. Help us to believe in this Jesus. If by faith in this generation, he does. Thank for yours. I pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen.